Hello, everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Welcome to Super Spreading Bitcoin 2022. This week in Bitcoin. Today is November the 12th. 2021 strong hand long-term thinking one day closer to an all-time high one minute closer to an all-time high we had an all-time high this week wow i'm offended by selling don't fomo on alts bitcoin is the next bitcoin all right dudes hello my elite friends it is great to be here again. We had a show on Wednesday, the One Bitcoin Show. Check it out. It's linked to below. But we're coming to you every week thanks to the uh, Bitcoin 2022 event. And Bitcoin Magazine puts on this show for me every freaking week. And I bring you the best guest in the space from all over this freaking planet. We've got two Americans making their returns to the show. Surfer Jim is surfing in. And we got Denver Bitcoin. But we got Luke. In freaking Brisbane, which now is you know occupied by China or something, or just ideologically, <laughs> ideologically it's occupied by China. I mean, they're a fascist uh, country now, Australia. But Brisbane is a beautiful city when it is free, and I am uh, happy to deb debut Luke on the show. He's he hasn't been on the show before, but he's got his own uh, show, and he'll he'll talk about it and everything. Now, I, I want to start this show off on a positive note because. You know, we're going to talk about the, the events of this week in Bitcoin. And hey, this week there was an all-time high, but yet we're really calm about it here. We're calm about it here because also, I mean, in, in a few hours, a few days, whatever, is going to be the 210,000 block anniversary of December of 2017 when Bitcoin hit its all-time high back then of 19,600. And it, it, it marked a a special place in the cycle. So if you've been around since then, uh, since th that point in December of 2017, you have now, you know, once this weekend is over, you have joined a special fraternity, a 210,000 block fraternity. You made it through. You had a strong hand. You held on to your Bitcoin. Okay. So welcome to this fraternity. I've been through this now, what, what, twice or something like this. You made it through a cycle. Um, your four-year initiation is over. It really is. It's really like getting into a fraternity here. I mean, the, the, the last four years, 46 months, 47 months, it's quite an initiation psychologically, what you have to go through. But in the end of the day, if you made it through with your Bitcoin since that moment, um, you are freaking happy right now. And that's part of the reason that, you know, when we had an all time high earlier this week, yeah, we're like, yeah, okay. So what? That's It's an all time high. I've seen. So if you've been through it, if you've been here since 210,000 blocks ago, you've seen it all. So there'll be different variations of it all coming up bigger and better and scarier for the normies, but you should be proud of yourselves. You should be very proud of your strong hands. So I, I just wanted to uh, start it off on that note. I, I, Jim, when did you first get in to, uh, to Bitcoin? I forgot the exact. Uh, well, exactly would be a little bit before that point, that, that high in 2017. So I got to watch uh, a big run up in the, in the price. Um, and so uh, I was fortunate enough to get my first piece of a Bitcoin under $3,000. And so your theory has held, held true. If you hold for 210,000 blocks, it'll be worth more. And even though I was buying on the way up all the way to 17,000 or whatever, 19, whatever it turned out to be, um, you know, I didn't sell any of that stuff and I just held on to it and it's all like tripled by now, you know? So the theory continues and I love it. Oh, well, I, gotta, I gotta say one thing, Adam, I yeah. take your advice. I listen to all my podcasts at 2X. Your introduction today sounded so slow to me because <laughs> I'm used to hearing you say it twice as fast. Anyway, can tell that freaking like button. That is that <laughs> describes my whole life. Okay. Like I <laughs> I listen to everything at 2x and like sometimes when someone only has the podcast version and I can't play it at 2x, uh, this is so freaking slow. Yeah, I cannot so, take totally. it. I cannot take I feel it. like I'm wasting my time. It's like I can hear it. I can comprehend. Most people talk slow enough that at 2x, it's very comprehensible, unless they have a really strong accent or something. 
Yes, so, anyway. I, I agree with you. So, guys, that's your life hack of the day. Play yeah. everything with two hacks. And <laughs> I really think it, it, it increases your brain uh, power. Let, let's just put it that way. But, Jim, congratulations. You uh, welcome. Welcome. You made it through. You made it through the storm. Uh, Denver, how about you? When did you first get in? Yeah, no, I didn't get in until so Bitcoin had already crashed from 20 to about 8,000. So it was like end of January, February of 2018. So right after the the run up. So, I mean, I know I started for me, you know, holding, yeah, holding Bitcoin 210,000 blocks. That's, it's not easy. Um, and certainly historically it's been a pretty good bet. My, my goal has been to, to be mining for 210,000 blocks. That was always something that I kept in mind and I didn't get, I mean, I got like a personal Bitcoin miner up and running pretty recent to when I discovered Bitcoin, but I didn't get like my, my actual Bitcoin mine up and running until the 600,000 block. And so it was like right at block 600,000, I remember is when I started mining. So it was like, you know, October, September of 2019. Um, and so I'm still, I'm still looking for, you know, block 810,000, 820,000 for me to really feel like I've, I've, I've made the journey, but you know, still it's been, it's been turmoil. It's funny. I mean, Jim says, you know, his first buy was, was below like right around $3,000. I remember that was like, about when I started buying really, really hard, but I, I caught it on the other end, right? It, it went up to 20, came back down, and that's when I was, you know, standing on the gas pedal. So, I got to tell um, you, when I saw that, right? when I saw that, I, I couldn't believe my the opportunity of a lifetime. Like Adam, last year, same thing in March. Same thing. I couldn't find enough money to buy enough Bitcoin when it crashed again, and I thought another opportunity around my same entry level – I will say that I've never seen or been able to purchase Bitcoin less than the very first purchase I made. Okay. So. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I will say, yeah, yeah. Denver is describing the 3,000 after the uh, yeah, 19,000. Yeah. Jim was describing the 3,000 before, but it doesn't matter. I mean, they both, it's, it, it's awesome. And yeah, so uh, Denver, you're going to be, you're going to get your four year anniversary, but you've basically been through a whole entire cycle. And we are going to talk about, I mean, you got hardcore in the mining. We're gonna, re you're gonna give us the the down low on that. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing. I, I think a lot of people are. Uh, and and just just to remind everyone that this show is brought to you by, by Bitcoin Magazine. And I saw and, and come to the event, Miami. You know, back in uh, the beginning of this cycle, one could not imagine a thirty thousand person event in Miami. Uh, but sure enough, here at this part. Uh, well, starting a new cycle, whatever you want to say, it's very much expected that we're going to have 30,000 people in Miami on April 6th to 9th. Hopefully I'll see these two guys again. I saw that I was hanging out with them in Miami uh, in person, got to, to hug them uh, in, in uh, you know, when we just had it in June. So uh, we, again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later, but everybody use the affiliate code below if you want to buy tickets. It's Adam10. Uh, but I, I want to go to Luke real quick because, dude, how long you been? You, how old are you? I, I, can you say how old you are or around how old you are? Yeah, of course I can. Uh, I'm doxed. I'm 24 years young, and I think I had a similar journey to Denver. I think I got in after that 2017 run up. I was watching on the sidelines as a no coiner, thinking what is going on, and I think uh, watched the 2018 drawdown from 20k to 6k. I think I bought my first little chunk of Bitcoin at about 6K. And then I watched that 50% uh, minor death spiral, as they called it. And then obviously started to dig in a little bit deeper there at the bottoms in 2018. Yeah, wasn't, that, and, wasn't that right when BCH split? No, BCH yeah. split was no, no, no. It, it, that, that was it. August of uh, August 2017. 2017. Yep. That's when it I first missed all of 3, that. That's when it, Bitcoin had never been to 3,000 before. And in August. No, of, no, no. Not when. No, not when. Oh. Bitcoin cash split off of Bitcoin, but oh. Bitcoin cash split into Bitcoin cash and SV or whatever the fuck, right? Uh, that was like just, a year later. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. Was gonna, okay. okay. It was a year later. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I thought oh, it was the 2018. It was right when, right when Bitcoin chopped in half. Yeah. It was like, oh. I, I, you know, I was new. I remember all this. I was like, what is all this other shit? You know, and then my Bitcoin, all this money I put into Bitcoin got chopped in half and I was excited. I mean, I was, I was bullish on it. So right there, right there with you, Luke. I mean, I, it was, it was rough. Wait, wait. Now, now Luke says he was in a similar position to these guys, but he wasn't. You're 20 freaking years old back then, dude. That is awesome. As a 20-year-old yeah, right? as, as that you start, 
<laughs> you start your economic life as an adult, uh, basically, by uh, buying Bitcoin. That's that's a really good accomplishment. I, I got to say, it's a, li- a bit different than the than the, the the other two guys on the panel here. I think I think they'll agree with that too. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's uh, that, that's that's pretty impressive, dude. Da- down hey, on- Adam, do, do we have time to hear his uh, story? How he got in so- at such a young age? What did he see? At yeah, yeah, Luke, like- tell us, Luke. What the heck? Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, you're asking for trouble, guys. This normally turns into a long story. Well, yeah, uh, keep it relatively <laughs> He's, he's going to tell us about hyperinflation later, too. So he's no average 24 freaking year old here. But yeah, real quick, how did how did 20 year old Luke get into it? In, in Austria, uh, freaking Brisbane. Yeah, so I think I was at university. Um, I was uh, studying there for two years, always wanted to get out of the rat race. Um, and then I was kind of looking at property investing as a way to get out of university, buy my own home, rent out the rooms, because obviously I was unemployable from a very young age. Um, I suppose I was a Bitcoiner without knowing I was a Bitcoiner, always wanted to get ahead. Um, and then found Bitcoin in 2017, 2018. And I thought, hey, um, this is the solution to the problem I've been looking at. I was looking at property prices just going up into perpetuity. And then obviously you realize the money's broken. That's why property prices are going up into perpetuity. So that's that's my rabbit hole journey, I suppose. Okay. So, I mean, you're, you're always an outside the box type of guy. I mean, clearly, uh, if you knew about this early on, when you, when you found out about Bitcoin in your early years, I mean, was anybody else talking about it in Brisbane? Oh, no, no, no. Um, no, 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 I was I was very alone. I was in Tasmania at the time, and oh. um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the people in Tasmania are even more wild than the people in Queensland. So I was certainly alone in talking about macroeconomics and uh, money down there with my with my friends in Tasmania. Did, did you grow up in Tasmania? What state yeah. did you grow up in? Uh, Tasmania for oh my years. lord. Well, I never met someone that I, I wanted, if Australia wouldn't have become a fascist country, that was going to be like the next state I visit. I mean, I've been to the uh, six largest cities in Australia and I've also been to Darwin. Um, so I want, I really wanted to go to Tasmania and I'm, it's, it saddens me that uh, it's become a fascist state. And, but there's a guy in the chat, Kiwi bloke, who's even in a worse place, New Zealand, where they, they have the worst uh, president, president on earth, I think, or one of the worst presidents on earth. Uh, mommy, mommy president over there wants to take care of everybody and they're white. Everybody's talkless. But hello, Kiwi bloke. <laughs> how you, how, how you doing? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a woke nation. I mean, they are beautiful countries physically, but that they, they totally have, you know, bowed down to the fear of China and just, they're just, everybody's scared. So I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. Everybody, um, we're, we only need $69 for the next one Bitcoin show. So keep on, uh, keep on sending those, doing those super chats. You can ask questions to in the door. So with the super chat or type in Bitcoin Meister, like Kiwi bloke did in New Zealand and uh, I, I want to thank from the last show, we had someone named Hope that, that sent a good contribution. So keep on sending them and I'll mention everybody that does that and I'll read your comments. So let us uh, let us get to the, the bulk of the show here. And we, we, we start off on a happy note, but let's start off on a uh, disturbing note. Uh, the, well, the real life now. Denver Bitcoin had a tweet. The climate battle is an intentional never ending war meant to allow for trillions of dollars to be created, washed, and funneled to regulators and their cronies. All right. So, yeah. But the the problem is, is that young people like Luke uh, have been now brainwashed for quite some time, and they're not, like, young anymore. Some are in their 30s. That this is, like, the climate. It is the most important thing in the world. You know, I don't care about yourself. Care about the climate. Everything that involves, the, you know, machines and progress uh, should be put to the side, and we need to slow down to protect the earth and protect uh, Mother Nature, and that is what we and we must be deathly scared of the end of the world. That the end of the world, even though people have been calling for it for decades now, it is is going to happen. So. I, I bring this up because we're going to talk about mining, Bitcoin mining, and a lot of the hate that and there is we're going to talk about Bitcoin hate, too. I mean, it's based on envy, but it is like in an emotional reaction. There is no thinking at all because Bitcoin mining uses energy. Use of energy means death of the environment. It means end of the world. 
it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter that it might be producing wealth. It might be bettering the world, you know, making people wealthy, bringing people out of poverty. No, no, no. Energy use is a bad thing. So, Denver, what is your take on this? We're going to get into the Navajo article in a second, but just give us what you what you've run into in terms of you know your in what you're doing with mining and the the fud that you hear every day that involves the environment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so real quick, I'm, I am passionate about this topic, but I got some of my contacts, so I am I'm not crying over here, but I mean, I am <laughs> I am passionate about this. Um, no, so the. I mean, the reason I tweeted that out and, and really kind of my thesis behind it is just kind of what you said, Adam. It's it's the fact that, and I think everyone here can, you know, and you know, feel free to disagree if, if you do, but just like what you said, the, the, the idea, this moralization of, of energy production and, and energy consumption, that anytime we consume electricity, it's, it's an immoral act that has a one-to-one -one relationship with destroying the habitat we, you know, occupy. Um, and I just think that that's, that's, you know, unfounded. And I think that's a real, that's a bullshit kind of way to look at it. Apologies there, but you know, it really, it's just overarching crap, right? It's just not, it's not accurate. One of the things that John Vallis brought up in a conversation I had with him that I thought was, you know, it's, it's really never touched on is everything we do as humans has an environmental impact, has some type of impact, right? Whether, whether you're going to build a walking path through you know, through a forest, just so that people can go enjoy the forest. Well, that path has some type of an impact on that environment, right? And what we do is we weigh that impact, you know, relative to its benefit, relative to the fact that now maybe we, you know, have people, people have access to, to enjoy this forest or, you know, to, to walk through it without having to fall into a, you know, <laughs> some, some type of freaking sinkhole or something, right? Um, you know, the idea that, we don't ever talk about the positives of something, you know, of something's energy use. And so this idea that carbon dioxide, really that's what, you know, this, this ESG movement is about. It's really about carbon dioxide. Um, this, this idea that carbon dioxide is a one-to-one -one measurement with destroying the planet, I think is, is false and it's damaging, right? And it's really a way to create a new column in the accounting book, um, carbon dioxide. And so even if you're not profitable as a business, right, you're not nominally profitable as it relates to the U S dollar, um, you can, you know, be virtuous in the call in the column of carbon dioxide, and that will offset your economic loss, right? Your virtuous, your virtuous gain offsets your economic loss. And what it allows for is inefficient, you know, energy to displace efficient energy production under the grounds of this is a more moral way to produce power. And in my opinion, the most moral way to produce power is the most efficient way to produce power. And, and truly, I think we need, we need all types of power generation, energy production, in order to really advance as a species. And so this is, you know, I, the mantra, I, I put it this way. I think there's two types of environmentalists, right? People that would call themselves environmentalists. And I, and I would consider myself that. There are those who think that we need to mitigate consumption, minimize consumption, and return back to some type of 19th or 18th century way of living, right? Where it's like, which, which by the way, it's really interesting because then what are we going to do? Like, you know, are we going to deforest in order to, to, you know, produce power? Are we going to burn timber or, you know, what are we going to do about all petroleum products? Are we going to go back to whaling and, you know, using whale fats and like, you know, living hydrocarbons um, rather than dead hydrocarbons. And so th there's those environmentalists. I'm not in that group. I'm in the group of, I, I think that with technological advancement, you know, we can one mitigate and, and use waste and two optimize energy production and power generation as well as power distribution. And Bitcoin will be a, will be a, a carrot, right? A signal out there in the sky that gets individuals, human beings, human capital to wake up every day and work toward creating a, a more efficient or a, or a better use of waste energy because they're going to be economically rewarded for doing that. And so Bitcoin is kind of this, I see Bitcoin as this carrot that's going to cause a kind of an industrial re-revolution, right? A renaissance in energy production because anybody that innovates around energy, energy production, power generation, and waste mitigation, waste energy mitigation, they're going to be directly financially rewarded by this awesome thing called the Bitcoin network. Yeah. Energy is guilt. Guilt is energy is like what, what what's, Correct. Uh, that's the mainstream narrative. I recommend everybody uh, follow Alex Epstein on uh, Twitter. Or, or I recommend a, that as well. He is a dude that uh, clearly explains that that's the, the opposite is true. Okay. You shouldn't be guilty about progress okay and bitcoin is 
spurring freaking progress in places where there has not been progress for a while. Uh, there's an article from Vice that is obnoxious that makes uh, uh, Bitcoin out to be uh, Bitcoin miners out to be colonizers of the Navajo, uh, the, the the Navajo reservation in Arizona and New Mexico. They they have a, a big amount of land. I don't know if it's in Arizona, New Mexico, both, whatever. And it's I link to it below. It's it's disgusting. It it buys into every narrative that is out there now. Um, that the, you know the, the Navajo are, are, are basically helpless, and that the big rich capitalists are, are putting a mining on their land and aren't, aren't helping them. And it's, I mean, it's it, they don't talk about it. It's stranded energy that nobody else would be. I mean, they're making the most of stranded energy. We could talk about stranded energy in a second. And uh, well, since I've alluded to this Navajo article. Jim, do you have anything to say about that Navajo article? Uh, yeah, you touched on it. It's stranded energy. Like it, it was being used uh, to help apparently power a coal processing facility that went offline. They had all this extra capacity to make electricity, but they had nobody to take it. Um, it's also not easy. The, the Navajo Nation is 17 and a half million acres. And so if you're not close enough to where you're producing the energy, it's not cost effective. To transmission to transfer it over transmission lines uh, because you lose uh, you lose energy along the way and you know there's a lot of costs you you got to send wires for miles and miles for how many homes you know so who's paying for it one of the things I would say is whoever negotiated the deal um, in, the article says they had 51 percent of this mining operation and then they sold it back to the Canadian company who brought all the equipment so the Navajo Nation somebody made a to me, a bad business decision. They were in on some Bitcoin mining as a nation and they could have started accumulating Bitcoin. It seems like to me. So if they want to be upset, not they shouldn't be upset with the company who brought in the Bitcoin mining, which could turn the nation around. They should be upset with the people who made the deal with that company for not making a better deal for the Navajo Nation, it seems to me. All right. Um, Luke, you are in Australia. You might not... Uh, first of all, in Australia, they're, they're fed so much guilt about the natives of their country. My Lord, much more so than in, I mean, the, the, what, what, what the people there feel about the Aborigines. And uh, I mean, well, anyway, I won't get into the whole Aborigine thing. If you, if you actually see the Aborigines in Australia, it's quite, uh, quite shocking. Uh, but uh, Luke, your, your take on the, uh, that, that article. Yeah, it was certainly just another, you know, run-of-the-mill propaganda slur coming from the, um, as Laser Hoddle calls them, Malthusian elites. Um, I think Denver touched on something really interesting there. Uh, he said something along the lines of Bitcoin incentivizes us to create a renaissance around energy production and energy waste. And I think that's exactly what Bitcoin mining is going to do for us. I think this idea of actually taking energy that's generally wasted or flared into the atmosphere. And instead of that energy being wasted and um, put into the, uh, the atmosphere uh, as, a, uh, as a pollutant, uh, using that energy to mine Bitcoin, uh, the world's soundest money, I think that is a, a renaissance-inducing uh, um, idea. I think, that's, I think Bitcoin is going to revolutionize how we see energy and energy wastage. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So I just can't. It just baffles me that all of these mainstream articles never take a positive step, positive spin on it. it they've all bought into this narrative that. Well, this is the problem. This is, I'm sorry. I, I mean, to interrupt. But this is the problem, right? Is that is that it, we're in the midst right now where instead of guys laying, you know, guys and men and women laying in bed at night, think dreaming of ways to to produce power more efficiently, more effectively, more economically. They lay in they lay in bed and, and think of ways to sell a virtue story about how they're the cleanest, greenest power. Right. So it's not about actually innovating. It's about innovating the narrative. Right. And so it's more about like that's why you see so many guys come out like, yeah, we're we're, we're you know, green Bitcoin miners. Right. We only mine on renewable energy and stuff. That's that is just a really, really that's a lazy man's way of trying to innovate is saying like, oh, yeah, like we're doing this thing, too but we're really virtuous in saving the planet when we're doing it. That's, and, and that's just a crony game, right? That's a game that, that's getting played so that, that that column, that carbon dioxide column in the accounting book gets pumped up, right? In order to get it pumped up, you have to make deals. You have to be a certified, um, what is it, sequesterer of carbon. Um, you have to, you know, how do you, get a, how do you become a certified sequesterer of carbon? Well, you have to apply. Well, who fucking approves you, right? Well, it's like, at the end of the day, you're sitting there and you're, you're subject to these, these kind of gatekeepers 
who can subsidize your power generation um, merely for, under the guise of, you know, you're saving the planet. And, and, and that's what guys, you know, people lay in bed at night dreaming about is how do I get a subsidy? They don't lay in bed dreaming, how do I generate power cheaper than, than the next guy? And now they will. Bitcoin will, will shut the subsidies up. The subsidies will be not nearly as attractive because you have to be on the inside. You have to get a deal. Well, with Bitcoin, anybody can do it. I mean, a 15-year-old kid, Luke, nine years ago, could have could have woken up and sold freaking a gigawatt of power to the Bitcoin network, right? I mean, because, and he doesn't have to ask anyone's permission. So ultimately what we're going to see is this, it's going to be this signal in the sky that's going to break all of these all of these regulator, all of these regulations and all of these market forces that are creating disequilibrium, right? Bitcoin will just, it will force a kilowatt hour to be properly priced around the world. No matter what anybody tries to do, a kilowatt hour is going to have this secondary market, the Bitcoin network, and nobody can bastardize that, right? It's, it's unbelievable what government interference can, can, can cause here. And, and it's just what, how the market can be totally put into a, it's not, it's not a market when it's fascism like this, when it, you know, they're saying, well, no, you can't, we're going to give you carbon credits and all it's, it's a made up make believe, uh, clown world carbon credits. I, I just, totally. it's, it's, but it's, it's not that crazy. I mean, the U S dollar is already a, just a, a coupon, right? I mean, it's a little token. So it's like, it's not that crazy to step over to this carbon coupon. Like, honestly, it's, you know, guys, really it's like the mental shift isn't that insane they're already printing trillions of that i mean what, what what's the difference they print this you know carbon token and give it to companies to go sell like i don't think i don't think that there's much of a leap there and there's the next leap will be even easier right and so we're gonna i mean we're gonna devolve at this point um bitcoin will just i mean but at the end of the day bitcoin's gonna be signal right like you can't cannot shut up that that price in the sky the fact that right you know every day there's 55 million dollars of rewards you know given out to the to the network participants you can't shut that up nobody can shut that down and so you can't regulate you can't regulate that away um you deadweight loss is going to be more and more penalized because of bitcoin's existence right that opportunity cost the deadweight loss that regulators create always create it's just going to be more stark more obvious and, and more apparent to anybody that takes you know a little bit more than a surface look at, at the market at an energy market Really great point about, you know, if they if people already accept the, the inflated dollar, why not, you know, accept some other weird token uh, called uh, carbon credits? Uh, and, yeah. and that kind of goes to my point, too, where I think uh, a lot of people just buy the narrative so much that uh, we'll never have hyperinflation. And we'll, we'll talk about with this with Luke soon. Uh, the dollar will never be hyperinflated because a part, partially hyperinflation is psychological, is, is a loss of faith in, in the currency. And just so many people are willing to have blind faith in the government in so many things. I, I don't see how they can lose faith uh, in, in the dollar. I mean, many people will, but uh, plenty of people won't. Uh, well, speaking about uh, countries and uh, what, was it the worst move ever? Uh, China kicking out the Bitcoin miners, uh, Denver? Yeah, I mean, that was a fuck up. I think, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, it almost makes makes me think like, you know, you can, you can come up with whatever, whatever conspiracy, but it makes me think that that China has been moving the market and playing the market for years that they like have, you know, like seriously, the, the state has been to the point where they're like, yeah, we're going to announce that we're banning Bitcoin and they go put up, you know, they put up a bunch of short positions and then they go announce it. And I mean, cause they banned Bitcoin like four or five times now at this point. Oh, um, and I truly, I, yeah. And I, and I think that this was one of those kind of thing. I mean, it could have just been them trying to, to, you know, move the market in a way that they, that, you know, they had, they had made bets on before. Um, and they overplayed their hand where, where hash rate actually left, right? I think that they imagined most of the hash rate, most of the hardware wouldn't get very far before that, before they could turn around and say, actually, you know what? Bitcoin mining's fine. Um, and I think that that was a, a terrible bet, right? Because it's hard to move tens of thousands of these new machines. I mean, you need, you need, you need megawatts and megawatts of power, like, like hundreds of megawatts of power at times. And so, you know, that's not something that's easy to find. And so, there's still a lot of machines that are sitting in China in warehouses looking for homes around the world, um, but they're dwindling, right? I mean, they're finding homes and these guys are ambitious. The price is too damn good. I mean, where are we at? 63, 773. I mean, the price is too good to not bring that hash rate online to just sit on those machines. So guys are making deals and those machines are leaving. If they wait too long, it, it, they'll, you know, mining will be established elsewhere in the world and, and China will be, you know, half a decade behind trying to catch up. That being said, oh. they can fire. I mean, that being said, China can fire up power really quick. I mean, they have so much hydroelectric power that they could just literally, you know, snap of a finger, they could throw on 
20,000 megawatt, a 20,000 megawatt dam. And, you know, they could, they could participate in Bitcoin mining probably tomorrow. They could, they could begin competing again. I think, um, miners, I think would be hesitant to go, to go play over there because they got kicked out once. But if the price is cheap enough, miners are already risk takers. They'll go gamble, right? Like, I mean, somebody will, some miner will. Well, now, since China made this foolish move, what have you noticed in North America? I mean, you, you're you part of oh, a big part of the North American market. Tell us what's going on. Tell us it's what's booming. Going on. It's absolutely fucking booming. It's absolutely booming. Sorry. It's absolutely booming. Um, a great person to talk to would either be like like Al's Lacrosse or uh, Parker Lewis. So those guys started a, a Bitcoin meetup in Houston. I think they started in like March and they started it with like 12 people at a bar or something. Um, I joined in June. And we were up there, they like had like 75 or 85 people came in June um, to, a, to a bar that we were kind of outgrowing. And then by August, we had 200 people in a gigantic warehouse in Houston. We had CNBC there. They wrote an article about us. Um, somebody from Ted Cruz's um, campaign, political party campaign thing was there. And so he, he put a bug in Ted Cruz's ear about, you know, Bitcoin mining absolute mania i mean there is so much bitcoin activity bitcoin mining specifically activity in north america right now the united states and canada it's immeasurable the amount of people i'm talking to that are looking to bring hash rate online that are looking to make deals in the oil field and and honestly i'm talking to guys tons of guys in the oil field i'm talking to tons of home miners because of our black box product that's coming out i mean guys that are looking to have you know two to five s19s two two to five of these brand new machines at their house um which is a significant amount of hash rate you know five you know half a pet hash 500 tera hash um I'm talking to guys that have that have farms that have um, ho like hog or, or cattle methane digesters. They're already generating power, selling it back to the grid for three cents a kilowatt hour. Mining Bitcoin with S nines, they can get fifteen cents per kilowatt hour right now. It's a, it's insane. So they're you know it's a five x better market to mine Bitcoin than what they're currently doing. Um, I mean, everywhere the power is already being generated, it likely makes sense to drop a Bitcoin mine of X size just to optimize your your downstream market right and so we're seeing a, we're seeing it we're i mean i i called this in 2018 i said that that bitcoin was going to disrupt upstream energy production specifically oil and gas and that inevitably these oil and gas producers were going to come and they were going to learn about this and they were going to become the best bitcoin miners of the decade and i think we're, we're right at the top of the first inning of that happening you know these petroleum engineers geologists chemical engineers they're learning about bitcoin they're participating in the network which then gets them to learn about Bitcoin's characteristics and, and they send transactions and they're cashing out and things, right? They, they learn what this thing is. It's not just this magic internet money anymore to them. Um, and these are really smart people. They're running with it, right? And they're going to they're gonna run really far with this. They're going to optimize and they're going to compete for the next decade because these guys know how to produce power. They know how to produce energy, which is the name of the game when it comes to mining Bitcoin. So really exciting time. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many hours I've slept in the last 30 days, but it's I could count it, you know, probably on like, fingers and toes <laughs> so that that was so bullish and so truthful and so off the mistake that china has made and so we have all these people out there that have, that, that try to say united states should compete with china and this that and the other look at this we, we are, are. The united states is now the capital of bitcoin mining basically is what you're saying uh, i think or, or or will soon be uh, and but we have haters in the government that want to regulate Bitcoin out of existence, think it's a negative thing. Look at all the wealth that because of China's mistake that is coming to the United States and good for Texas, good for Ted Cruz. Um, and, you know, we're going to have it, it's beautiful that we have 50 states because, you know, some of them will just be insane and, and buy into the narrative. But Texas sure isn't in, buying into the uh, they, they they know well, fitting is, is overrated. They know to, you know, this is where the money is. We're going to we're going to do well. But sorry. Sorry to interrupt. you. No, no, no. You're good. But you're right. Obviously, with Texas, a lot of the representatives there, they're backed by oil and gas and oil and gas sees that this is a tool to help them be a better producer, to be better producers of oil and gas. And so. The oil and gas lobby is going to be pro Bitcoin, at least the upstream oil and gas lobby. Um, but beyond that, I think, you know, one thing one thing that is often missed and one thing that maybe, you know, isn't isn't talked about all that often is the fact that while the United States may gain a significant percentage of global hash rate, I would argue that the hash rate in North America, the hash rate in the United States, Canada is the most competitive hash rate, meaning there's the most it's the most diversified ownership. Right. It's not like there's one company that's owning all of these Bitcoin mines that are popping up all over the United States. No, no, it's like there are a lot of individuals, a lot of participants jumping into this 
to into the space to compete, which is a great thing for Bitcoin. It geographically helps decentralize the network. There's going to be a lot of off grid and on grid mining. So even if grids go down, we, we're processing blocks. Um, I mean, there's there's a defense a defensibility to this idea that you know I don't, that's why we did it. We we encouraged right people to mine at home while we're building a product for it because we look at the world and we say, hey, if a million people have a hundred terahashes. Right. If a million people have one S19 J Pro at their house, okay, that's that's literally a hundred exahashes of of hash rate. That would almost double the network, okay? And that would be incredibly defensible. You can't go shut down a million people that are scattered all over the United States that you have no idea if they're mining or not, right? You can make it illegal and make them criminals, but you can't actually go door to door and shut that down. And so that is unstoppable. It's like it's like nodes that way. And so, yeah, I mean, it's we're in a time right now where. Bitcoin is becoming much more rigid, much more defensible. And and at this point, I don't think any government, even a coordinated government attack could, could touch it. Ooh, that, that's great news, too. I mean, that's a, 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 a FUD talking point right there. You know, government shutting it down. You just uh, obliterated it real quick uh, before we move on. Uh, well, first of all, you have any good insider information on mining that people might not know about? So, so, a, a little something that might... Uh, get people excited that you want to share. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things that people say. So I hear a lot of people talking about how there's like a minor shortage like or an ASIC shortage, how they're really hard to find all stuff. Not true, there's tons of machines out there. I mean, we're at, we're at, I think, what, like 161 exahashes, 161 million terahashes over the last 2016 blocks. So um, I'd say we've got another 25 million terahashes to come online, which is a lot. Um, in order to get 1 million terahashes, you need 10,000 of the new machines, right? 10,000 S19s. And so there's a lot of machines that are still out there looking for homes. Not all of them are for sale, but they're out there. That's one. And then two, if you look at the numbers, I just I was just on Brains. By the way, you should check out Brains OS, their dashboard. If, you, if you're a miner, it's the absolute greatest dashboard out there. Um, I was just looking, and these machines are incredibly profitable. Like even in Hawaii, even in Australia, these new machines, I was just looking, they're earning 35, 45, 50 cents per kilowatt hour, 50 cents USD per kilowatt hour with the Antminer S19 Pro. So if you don't think that you can compete at home, I guarantee you that your power's, it's, it's very likely your power's not above 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So at least in the current situation, like a way to DCA Bitcoin, having a miner running at your house, my God, like it's, in, it's incredibly profitable. Bitcoin goes on a bull run. These numbers could get even, these could even be funny. So this could potentially be a golden age of Bitcoin mining. I mean, insider information is, the, the the downside to getting some hash rate online right now is a lot lower than the upside is, you know, positive. It's a very asymmetric bet that way. A lot, a lot of potential upside if you get some hash rate online. So, you know, I'd say look into it. See if you have the ability, see if you have the note, you know, the capability and the ambition um, to, to participate, right? Because it's the first time in, in the history of mankind that every single human being, whether you're physically, you can be physically handicapped, right? You can actually compete in the production of money. You get to compete for the production of money, and that alone—it's almost like, you know, to squander that ability. I, I would absolutely regret it. I would, I would be pissed with myself. And so, I think to participate a little bit is, I don't know. At least for me, it's a compulsion. Oh, dude! You first of all, Daniel Sternthal in the chat says, "Bitcoin Meister, you always bring the best guests in the freaking space, Denver Bitcoin." Get me some miners, he says. Well, I got more, <laughs> my other guests haven't spoken for a while. Jim or. Uh, Luke, do you have any questions for Denver Bitcoin? He's, he said a lot here, and I think you might. Yeah. Uh, do you think um, the profitability of mining will level out um, as wider adoption uh, uh, occurs throughout the world? And if so, how long how long is that going to take? Well, that's the thing. So I'm, I mean, I'm bullish, right? So there's a, there's a bearish case to mining Bitcoin right now, and really it would be a bearish kind of a price case. But – but I've run the numbers right now and, and you know, you can check me on my numbers here, but what I'm seeing is the sheer mass of computational work on the network is so great at this point, right? We're at hundred, like I said, 160 million terahashes that in order for difficulty or competition to increase just 1%, that would be 1.6 exahashes, one point or 1.6 million terahashes. Well, using the best computers today, the Antminer S19, you know, pro in order to, to get there, you're going to need what, like over 10, like I said, over 10,000 of these machines, right? So we're talking about over a hundred million dollars potentially. 
of capital to be invested just for 1% difficulty increase, right? Not to mention, we're talking about 55 to 75 megawatts of continuous power generation, right? And so will, will it level out? Will the profitability of Bitcoin mining level out? Of course, it always should, because this is a rigorous market. This market clears like unlike any market before it. But if Bitcoin's price goes on a run, if, like if we see a, a similar you know, price growth to Bitcoin's history, we add a zero, right? We move the decimal place, essentially, and we get to six figures. Well, I don't think that hash rate can keep up with price the, the same way it has in the past, because in the past, we created new machines that were, you know, a, a hundred or a thousand times more efficient than the previous versions. Well, now they just they just announced in Dubai the new Antminer S19 X Pro, right? It's going to be 150 terahashes at 3,500 watts. Um, it's only 25% more efficient than the Antminer S19 or the S19 Pro, right? So it's only they only are jumping 25% efficiency. So we don't we're not going to be able to keep up with the hash rate. Won't be able to keep up because of technological advancement. In order for hash rate to keep up, we need commoditization. We need like millions and millions of these things to get produced. They need to be a lot cheaper than they are right now. And they need to be as plentiful as, you know, freaking cardboard. Um, but they also got to get standardized yeah. to the point where no nobody can make them more efficient because the next guy. Well, they're already there. there. Yeah, already I, there. I'm like, seeing that. I, I was kind of, and you're, yeah. even by your, um, you know, mentioning how there's only 25% increase versus the thousand percent. You right. Know, because the, you know, the technology can only get so good. It pushes up against Moore's law or something like that. You know, they would say, yeah, yeah. We're, at, we're yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess the, the, the layman way to say it, and, I, and I'm a layman because I'm not super technical in this, but um, you know, I did have a, a call with a guy that's worked at Apple for the last decade on their, on their semiconductor side. So he, he explained to me some of the, the constraints there, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to is trying to print a chip smaller than seven nanometer which is what yeah. the newest machines are at right the seven nanometer mark to drop down into the five nanometer mark even if one it, it happens which is a big if right it's a massive technological advance or, or jump and the cost to doing to cost to try to print at five nanometer um even if it is done the benefit is something like 23 percent increase right it's not the same as when we jumped from like 41 nanometer down to 21 nanometer and it was like you know this insane increase and it was really cheap you could take your your chip design at 41 or 42 nanometer and you could literally take that exact same design bring it over here to the 21 and like print it and all of a sudden it was way more efficient whereas what from what i understand when you get down to like below 12 nanometer you have to effectively redesign the entire chip because now you're in you're operating in such a small space right a five nanometer space that it's apparently it's tough to predict the direction of electrons, right? So you, you can't predict when you when you run a current, right? You, you run an electrical current into those transistors. You can't predict where the electrons are going to travel because you're in such a small space that they might jump. And so like we're, we're screwing with thermodynamic kind of like physical law here. So really what I'm saying is at the end of the day, if right now, if, let's say price doubled, okay? What would it take for, for the hash rate to double? Well, it would take like, 160 million terahashes, which would be I what 1.6 million S19 J Pros or something like that. Um, like it would just be absolutely bonkers, right? Which would be what 1.6 million of those at ten thousand dollars a pop. It's like 16, 20 billion dollars has to be invested. Like it's and and, that, and then all of a sudden it would have to they would have to have gigawatts of power overnight, right? So my bet is that so it's going to take a while. It's, it's, it's going to take, take a while. while. It's going to I take a while to get this infrastructure. So if price runs, I mean, these miners are going to be really expensive. I mean, it's going to be an absolute land grab, right? It's going to be a gold rush to try to get hash rate online because if they're making a dollar, a hash, you know, if it's a dollar per terahash per day, I mean, one of these S19s is making $100 a day. Well, it's not going to cost you $100 a day in power. It's going to cost you like nine. Um, and so you're 10xing your money passive income. People are going to freak out, right? And so, yeah, that's, that's the... That's the bull case, right? And I, I really, you know, unless we see Bitcoin drop to forty thousand and sit there for twelve months, like I think that's that's what I see the next 12, 18 months looking like. It's very, very economic, you know, kind of a golden age of mining Bitcoin. Um, the having's a healthy. We, we need the having. Thank God there's going to be a having because otherwise it would get so fat and so inefficient out there. Guys with twenty twenty cent power would be mining and, and scaling and crap, which which isn't good, right? I mean that's inefficient. So they'll get they'll get those guys will get knocked out at the having. But really, up until certainly until the next halving, I I mean, it's kind of like 
a free for all. Well, I, I like this. I like this type of t- Luke. Do you have any questions for uh, Denver? Yeah, that idea of putting a million uh, S19s in the homes of Americans or hardcore Bitcoiners all around the world from a way to kind of make the Bitcoin network really defensible. I'd never considered that. I'd always considered the fact we've got hundreds of thousands of nodes around the world really good and really decentralized and defensible, but I'd never considered the aspect of doing that with miners. I, I thought that was a really good point to kind of drill home on. It's well, yeah, and to, I, happening. Well, it's and I happening. think it, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think it would keep the market kind of honest and healthy too, because I think the, you know, this is, I'm just, you know, speculating here is my, this is my opinion. I, my belief is that a lot of the, the people who would want to mine at home, right? Like they would mine down to their break even and probably even a little bit below it. Like yep. they wouldn't go way below it, but they, I mean, like if, if my power bill was $300 a month because of my miner and I got $290 in Bitcoin, like I'm not going to unplug my miner, honestly. Like to me, it's like, it's a way of DCAing, you know, without giving my information. Um, it's not, and right, and honestly, it's a way to, I get Bitcoin paid to me before I have to pay my power bill. It's almost like Bitcoin on loan. Um, it's like DCAing, you know, and you don't have to pay until the end of the month. Um, and so, like, I think that that's a kind of a, a nice, a healthy thing for the market because it'll be, there'll be a lot of c- competition out there that isn't necessarily competing because of their economic, you know, marginal power production. They're competing because, of their desire to participate in, you know, creating the new money. And when that's out there, that will like, you know, through spikes and dips and stuff, we'll have this base load of hash rate that will keep the mempool from, you know, keep us from having these insane difficulty adjustments and having all this mempool, you know, bogged down because, you know, industrial guys, when they, if, if there's a Bitcoin crash, all, all the plebs won't pl- unplug. And so like the hash rate's only going to dip to a certain level before, you know, the plebs are freaking mining at a loss. They don't care. And these new machines are so efficient. Like, like I said, if they're making 40 cents per kilowatt hour today. Well, then you'd either need the competition on the network to quadruple, right? So like you're making, then you go down to like, you know, 10 cents or you need price to get cut, you know, by 75%. We need to go down to 15 grand Bitcoin for them to be at break even. And so those are pretty extreme circumstances that I think are worth, making an asymmetric bet on and that's and i think more people are going to figure that out they're going to realize that right maybe i i like that uh scenario where you talk about uh if someone mining at home it costs them three hundred dollars uh they get 290 dollars worth of it i i agree it's definitely uh worth it because and what about fees i mean yeah i mean even if they did 300 dollars on an exchange they're probably only going to get like 297 there's gonna be one or one or one and a half percent of fees anyway so it's like what you know it's all the same it's what they call virgin Bitcoin. You get your virgin Bitcoin there. It's a, a, a regular dude. And uh, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting scenario that, I mean, it is a freaking golden age. I well, yeah, and, and, and the best coin join is, is to pay your power bill, you know, pay your power bill with Bitcoin and, and mine Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that, that's the that's the best coin swap you can do, I think. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just to add to what Adam was saying, um, I happen to be in touch with a lot of Bitcoin people around the world because I'm plugged into this community. And and Adam and I are part of a Telegram group that meets every Friday night on Zoom and we talk all the time. And many of the members of that group are getting minors. And so you don't hear this out in the regular world. But we as a community, a Bitcoin community, recognize the value of decentralizing the mining industry into homes with a couple of miners. And these guys are dead serious. They talk about it every day on Telegram. They're figuring out stuff together. The the worldwide individual mining community is growing by leaps and bounds under the radar of everybody else out there that barely understands Bitcoin to begin with. And it's because of that insidiousness of Bitcoin as the signal, right? Where you lay in bed at night. And, and all you can, all I can think about is stranded energy and stranded power because I know that I will be rewarded if I go and take risk and, and tap that stranded or waste power into the Bitcoin network. So it, I, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, incentivized to go innovate and to go mitigate waste, which is a great thing, right? I mean, you think environmentalists would celebrate this technology. Uh, Jim, thank you for sharing that insider information about the Telegram thing. When he said Adam, he means Denver. De- Denver's name Sorry. is Adam also. It's no, yeah. Adam. He's Doc. I, I, I didn't want anyone to think that. Oh, Adam sorry. Place. That's right. 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 You both Adam. Adam, Adam Lace is on Telegram yeah. talking about Bitcoin <laughs> on sorry, a Friday sorry. night. I didn't even catch that. 
on a Friday night. It's Shabbat Shalom for me. Oh, but, uh, I totally forgot about Shabbat that. Shalom. Sorry. Shabbat, no, we're gonna and we're gonna have a Shabbat, a really nice Shabbat Shalom. But okay, you just you brought up stranded energy one one last time there, uh, Denver. And I just wanted to get your your take on uh, the Navajo thing. You didn't get to say. Uh, that. Yeah, and I want to go to. Yeah. I want to. I want to freaking go. I am going to get a car and drive across the country. I'm driving there. I'm driving. I want to see. Check it out. Yeah, go, go, go. Talk to people. See what they say. But like, and honestly, I mean, you'll be can. I know you. You're you're unbiased. You'll you'll sit. You know, you'll you'll relay whatever they say without putting your spin on it. Um, I think that's what we're seeing is a spin, right? I mean, it's a matter of, you know, ultimately in that article, if you dig through it, you see that they they talk about, hey, listen, like the power we're consuming is waste power. It's power that would have been ran into a load bank. Literally, it would have just been grounded. It would have just been ran into the ground. Um, had they not come in to, they, they literally brought a market to a power generation source. And so like, like I think, uh, Jim said earlier, they shouldn't be pissed with the guys that came in to fulfill that market. They might, they might have a, a standing to be, you know, angry with whoever made a shit deal or a bad deal with, you know, the, the people, but I, I don't think, you know, that's going to get, that's all in the nuance. It's going to get, lo- it's going to get lost in the story because the story is, you know, these Bitcoin miners are, they don't, they're all just profit seeking. It's the same thing they do the oil and gas industry. They act like they're just like these profit seeking monsters that they don't, they disregard human life and people's feelings and the environment. And they're just looking to go get money, which, which isn't the case, right? I mean, Bitcoin miners are power produ- power purchasers of last resort. So that's really what they did. They showed up as a power purchaser of last resort. I don't think to vilify them is to vilify, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, to, it's, it's to vilify anybody for filling a market demand. It's, I mean, to, I vilif- it's to vilify capitalism. And this is exactly. a, bigger, a bigger subject matter. So much of the world doesn't grasp what true capitalism is. This crony capitalism stuff, which is fascism, where you pick winners and losers. Yeah, it's terror. It, it, it's bad where the government picks winners and losers. But people, that's their capitalism. And thus, when real is something that's sort of like real capitalism is going on, they, they, they just they naturally hate it. And there's just yep. this, uh, we live in such a comfortable world that making money and it, people can hate on it now because they have so many nice things. They have so much time to be envious and there's an article in CoinDesk that says probably nothing why people still hate crypto. And there's there's a quote from it. But for those that haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, crypto appears to be hypercapitalism, capitalism plus. It prefers markets over the state to find solutions and protect everyday people. It's an ad yeah. for the already rich to make an almost insultingly large amount of money, which is, again, it, it's true, but it, people who aren't rich can make a lot of money off of it too. It advances the neoliberal turn towards financialization, globalization, and commodification of everything. And, and this was in commodification. Refer- I mean, th- this was in reference to, uh, I forgot, I, I, a bunch of people got angry on one of those social platforms that they were thinking about introducing a cryptocurrency and then the, and the people went insane uh, for, because they, 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 they hear the word cryptocurrency or Bitcoin and they, they don't want any part of it because it's evil because it's, it's making money. And I, I just, this, this it's only going to grow the Bitcoin hate because people hate capitalism. They're envious of wealthy people and they're looking for scapegoats that, are, that have done well from themselves and in today's world we live in, scapegoat goes scape scapegoating people is a new normal. Everyone's a white supremacist that you don't like. Everyone is. I mean, it's ugly. So get used to it, Bitcoiners. It's it's only going to get ramped up from here. We're we're all we're going to be caught insurrectionists. I mean, we already are. But I mean, it, it's every week. It, it seems I, I see more and more stories like this, and just the people that blindly buy into the narrative. So yeah. Yeah, it's probably nothing why people still hate Bitcoin. It is nothing. They're mindless, but it's there will be haters. At the same time, it's very strange. We have we do have plenty of people jumping into this NFT thing. They think it's cute. They think the Dogecoin thing is cute or whatever, which I, I think I look at it as a positive. At least these people. But it's are- still all about getting rich. It's, they're still all they all come to get rich still. I mean, they're not coming to NFTs because of the art or whatever the hell else is. They, they're coming to get rich. I mean, I mean and, but there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that either. But there's, no, there's people out there no. that think it's horrible that that, that anyone yeah. will come to Bitcoin to get rich. Um, so uh, I just I, I want to throw that out there. If any anybody has that, you know, any comments on the Bitcoin hate and how that has uh, evolved recently? 
Well, I'll, I'll say one kind of word because I got I got to jump here. One, I've got another call, but um, and thanks so much for how I lowered the show. Sorry for any swear words I let slip out. It's just right. yeah, that's cool, man. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, one thing I'll say is it's much like with the energy stuff, right? Where the, the blanket hate on capitalism, it's the same kind of a mentality as the blanket hate on energy consumption or the blanket, you know, the blanket hate on individual choice um, is really what this comes down to is that individual choice has been superseded by virtuism um, and the state. And so, yeah, it's, it, this is, these are two massive forces and, and Bitcoin is right in the middle, right? Bitcoin is kind of this, it's obviously going to end up the topic of discussion because it's, it's the, it's the crux they can't flip, right? They cannot, no matter how many mainstream articles they throw at Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't care. Right? It just keeps on behaving the same way it always has. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this goes to a head, right? Or how this comes to a head. I don't know how the, you know, the left and right will interpret it, well, whether they'll embrace it or hate it. My guess is they'll vilify it because they can't control it. Yeah, well, I'll just say that at least there are some politics. I mean, obviously, the the uh, what's her face from Massachusetts is going to go go with this, but it's great to see we got people from Wyoming and Texas that are the the, the complete opposite of of Elizabeth Warren and and and, and her ilk out there that will uh, no doubt go down uh, qu quite a hateful. But hey, don't put these uh, politicians on pedestals anyway. At, at Denver, thank you for being on. We're we're going to keep this. We're going to keep the show. Uh, going here yeah keep uh, it rolling luke, luke awesome to meet you man jim always great to see you guys cheers yep, man. see, see you, you thank you thank you pound that like button i mean best guest in the freaking space luke collectivism versus individualism it's it's boiling down to that what do you what what do you have to say about the uh the the, the bitcoin hate that's out there yeah anyone who thinks for themselves or you know promotes any kind of individualistic ideology is just going to be demonized moving forward you see it all around the world if you're not with us you're against us and we're going to make you uh, a demon uh you like you're watching prime ministers like justin trudeau come out and say if you don't do this or do that we're coming after you you don't have the right to be in public it's absolutely terrifying and i think bitcoin kind of embodies uh the individual individualistic ideology of you want to protect your own money and i think that's going to be demonized in the not too distant future they're going to want you to hold the cut bucks that are def uh, inflating at 20 to 30 percent a year to help pay for their 150 trillion dollar climate plan that that's that was the number they were floating at that recent um climate get together where, where was it that all the global leaders got together was, recently europe somewhere in europe it's yeah. got, always got to be in europe <laughs> yeah and i mean the the bill for the, the to save the climate for the next 30 years was 150 trillion dollars they need to print out of thin air um to help to help save the environment so um anything that furthers that agenda they're gonna be, get behind it and that's um, all the collectivist kind of ideologies and anything that's against it, like Bitcoin, anything that helps people protect themselves from that $150 trillion of printing that's coming down the pipeline, they're probably going to fight it. So I, I agree. There's certainly more. There's going to be lot, lots and lots more fights to come for Bitcoin, I think. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. I, I wanted to say I called Jacintha a president beforehand. She's a prime minister also. And she admitted that it, it was cool to have like a, a two-tier society in uh, uh, New Zealand. Uh, that, that, that would be perfectly fine with her. Uh, Jim, what, what's uh, your take on, on the big Bitcoin hate that's out there? Uh, yeah, well, it goes it goes deep and it goes far back. Um, it's all tied to the control of money around the world by a small group of people. Um because that's been going on for so long, they control many parts of society and can pay people to continue whatever narrative um, allows them to receive a paycheck and take care of their families. And it's, it can be very subtle from curriculum in schools, uh, teaching kids uh, things that uh, don't help them with their understanding of money on purpose uh, to, uh, to any other um, propaganda they want the masses to believe in and so when they tell you they're going to take care of you you know we're, we're the benevolent overlords you know and enough people are grow up around systems that reinforce that you get decades and decades of people that want to support this thing called the state which are just other people and those other people have have accumulated power and wealth because they basically control the money uh, and that and that's it they when you control the money you control the narrative uh you can you control people's lives look how many people walk around out in the open with masks on 
and they're not being forced to anymore. They were told they should, and they believed it. And it's just like the so group think is everywhere. Individualism and rational analysis of the world around you and, and looking at facts that doesn't work anymore. That was the world I grew up in, but no, that's like, that's old fashioned now, I guess, you know? And so uh, they're going to demonize anything that doesn't, that doesn't support, you know, of course the state doesn't like it because it takes their power away. And then all the people that think the state is still good are going to, you know, listen to all the FUD about Bitcoin and why it's terrible. I will say one thing though, which is sort of unfortunate. I, I'm a only, I'm a believer in Bitcoin only. I know you are as well, Adam. I, I also believe it's okay for people to experiment and do whatever they want. I, I believe people should be free as long as they're not hurting anybody. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are on purpose hurting other people with the 14,000 other cryptocurrencies that are out there and the promotions that some people, I think, knowingly do to steal the dollars or the Japanese yen from other unsuspecting new people that don't know what they're getting into. And so I think there's a lot of um, suspect behavior and it warrants being upset about, but they're, they then extrapolate that onto Bitcoin as if somehow it's Bitcoin's fault or something. And that's not right. It, it's so. the wild West here. It's a golden yeah. age. You're going to have crazy things come up. And so the collectivists will call because someone's scamming in some minor altcoin regulation of Bitcoin. I mean, exactly. Bit that's, the, that's the part that's the problem. So like the altcoin industry is not helping Bitcoin in some ways because of the control that other people have over the overall society still. That's that's just it, because, because they believe they have the authority to write words on paper and control people's lives even further, they say they're going to. And there are paid enforcers that will prevent you from fighting them if you don't listen. You know, they'll come, they'll steal your money right out of your bank account, or steal your freedom by putting you in a box because you didn't, you know, follow the rules on paper written by a bunch of people that live in Washington, D.C. that you don't even know. It's a, it's an absurd system, actually, when you get down to it. But it's what we have. I think Bitcoin changes all the incentives and takes the power out of the hands of these people because they can't control the money. They can't just add units into the system. I think the, the control freaks, when the screaming Karen starts screaming for, you know, protect us, that some of these altcoins will serve as a shield for Bitcoin and they will just take down these other projects, whatever ever you want to call them. I because they that. can't take down Bitcoin. They got to pick somebody. They got to yeah. do something. They got to show the screen Cameron Karen's they did something. So, yeah. and I, I am not calling for this. I don't think any of it should be regulated. I think people should use their freaking brains and be yeah. able to see, you know, one coin is fake and Bitcoin is real. This is fake. This is real. You know, uh, the, some of some of the stuff paying a million dollars for an NFT of your shoe is is insane. Uh, you know, I mean, Adam, the information is out there all over the Internet. If you take the time, you can filter through like I had to do it. There was nobody to ask a single question to half the podcasts that are out there now didn't even exist. It was a struggle. But you can if you rationally think it through, you look at how these things work, learn some stuff you, ha you had to struggle with. Like I had to learn about digital yeah, hashing algorithms or digital signatures, things I'd never heard of before. But I learned about them because if somebody put a video out that's free, this is not impossible for anybody. If they just put a little effort, they could figure this out. So if you get taken by some altcoin, it's just simply because you didn't pay enough attention. That's that's the free market. It's when it's knowingly pumped as a scam and somebody knows they're going to pull the rug out of other people. That's the part I don't like. But basically what but you're still saying- still caveat emptor in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now what you're, I want to sum up kind of what, what uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. This is your, these are your finances, people. You, managing your own finance, your financial future is an incredibly important aspect of your life. You can't just outsource it to the government and think they're going to protect you, Okay. That is a mistake. Now, I got a quote here that was on the side of Twitter. Like this was a novel thing. Rich millennials are rejecting financial advisors. It's easy to manage $500,000 or a million dollars yourself. Yes, yes, I agree with that. It is easy to manage $500,000 or a million dollars yourself if you understand personal responsibility is the new counterculture. What we've been trained to do, the narrative is, you know, let someone else take care of your finances. Then, you know, controlling your private key, bust that narrative up. And I love that. And, and I love that. Now, okay, is it is it's I shouldn't say it's easy to manage five hundred thousand dollars, but you it, you have to be able if you've got five hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, fifty thousand dollars, use your freaking head 
and manage it. Do not outsource it. But we we live in a world where this was a novel headline. This is a they they, they were making a big deal out of it. Oh, it's these these millennials are so to to, to they want to manage their own five hundred thousand dollars of wealth. How how different that's a, to me. That's like how dare yeah, they? get get rid of the middleman. Bitcoin is disintermediation, but the the regular world, the normie world, is not used is not ready for disintermediation. I mean, I know plenty of smart guys that are like Adam. I just have my financial advisor take care of everything for me. Okay. I, well, the I narrative, Adam, has always been that you need the help of an expert. You can't do this on your own. You're too stupid. You're, you know, you're you're just a regular guy, and and this is really complicated stuff. And you know, in some uh, period in time, you know, that's probably was much more true. But now we got the internet. You can learn anything. There's no excuse. There's there is no excuse out there. Just because your dad did it a certain way, guys, that's not an excuse. To, to not learn how to do this yourself and exactly. let a third party take care of it all for you. Control your own private key. But because there's so many people, they do learn about Bitcoin. They do learn about cryptocurrency. But then they're like, I'll just keep it at Coinbase. I don't want to learn the next step uh, uh, of taking care of it myself. And so not you your still, keys, not your coin. So you still got the middleman involved. That is the, the beauty of Bitcoin is no more middlemen if you if you if you do it right. So another mainstream narrative uh, that's uh, well, it made it to the mainstream media, but some some of the players try to paint it as as normal. Six point two percent inflation. So, uh, Luca, you could comment on stuff we were just saying before. Um, but but also I want you it's linked to below. Luke had a, a thread about hyperinflation. But uh, so I just threw a lot on your plate there. Talk about the 6.2% inflation, what you think about hyperinflation, if it's possible, and uh, anything that we just mentioned, if you had comments on. Yeah, firstly, on the self-custody thing, agree on everything you guys said. Um, I think technology is actually going to advance at such a rate around the Bitcoin self-custody space that it's going to be just as easy to set up like a multi-signature, whether it be with a custodial like Casa, like a, a third party that helps you out. I think it's going to be just as easy for a boomer to set up uh, a self-custodied multi-signature arrangement. And it's going to be more frictionless than going to the goddamn bank. So I, I think the whole notion of trusting exchanges and trusting custodians, I think that's something that a lot of boomers and a lot of people um, are going to have to relearn in Bitcoin. But I think they're going to relearn it. I, I think they're going to like um, actually taking responsibility for their own finances because it's easy now. You don't need to go to a financial advisor who tells you to do all these fancy things to try to get a, like a 7% investment on your money each year. You simply stack sats and you hold it and your savings account actually appreciates in value as Bitcoin appreciates in value. So I, th I just wanted to chime in there on the self-custody aspect. But then on the 6.2% uh, inflation, yeah, I think we all agree that figure's uh, bogus. If you have a look at the way governments used to measure inflation, um, looking at the Chappelled Inflation Index and shadow stats, real inflation is actually much more like 15%, not the 6.2% bogus inflation rate they tell us about. Like here in Australia, for example, our RBA, our central bank, claims that inflation is 3%. Meanwhile, house prices in every single capital city across the nation are up over 25% in the past year, you know, beef prices up 100%, chicken prices 100%. But obviously, the central banks like to manipulate that metric and say, hey, 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 look, inflation's only 2%. We can keep printing um, and enrich our cronies who hold all the assets and the stock market. So I definitely do think, um, I, I don't think we're going to actually get to the point where we reach the technical um, definition of what it, hyperinflation is, which is 50% per month. I think you're going you're gonna to get to a stage where inflation, in particular in the West, gets the 20 or 30% per year. And I think faith will just get lost in the currency. I think you've got a $100 uh, trillion dollar bond market. I think that's going to sell off a, a, a lot quicker <laughs> than a lot of people imagine it might. Um, and I think hyperinflation is inevitable. Um, obviously, the US dollar is going to be the last uh, just because of the euro dollar plumbing system that's um, built in around the world with the petrodollar system. But every single fiat currency, in my eyes, is going to hyperinflate. Um, and it's only a matter of time. And thank God we've got Bitcoin at this very unique time in history, because that's the thing about hyperinflation and these hundred year long term debt cycles that come around. They come around very rarely. So everybody who's alive today, most of them haven't lived for a hyperinflationary event Well, in the Western world. 
unless you live in a place like Argentina, who's defaulted and changed their currency three times in the past 20 years, you, you don't know what hyperinflation is. So you think it can't happen to you. So I think um, you in the United States, my star and myself in Australia, when we're trying to orange peel people and tell them that hyperinflation is coming, they look at us like we're crazy people because they, they, we've never lived through that. But when you just look for history, it's inevitable. When you get a debt level of 130% to GDP, uh, 51 out of 52 countries have defaulted on that debt. And the United States today has a debt to GDP ratio of about 130%. And when you have a magic money printer, that default normally comes in significant currency devaluation and hyperinflation. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to print into oblivion. All right, Luke, you can read Luke's uh, thread. It's below. He talks about, I, I know there's a lot of hyperinflation people that like, like to talk about it. I talk about happyflation because I, I, I truly believe the people will just keep on buying into it, think it's a good thing, and psychologically will not lose faith in the United States dollar ever. Um, you, you said that the you know Arg Argentina they of course they've been through it before. The funny thing is they haven't learned their lesson at all. They keep electing the same people who bring up the hyperinflation every twenty years. So it, it's mm. it's just unbelievable how compliant the uh, normies can be, even in a, in a place as beautiful as uh, as Argentina. Uh, they they make the same mistakes over and over again and, and follow the whatever the government tells them uh, is cool is cool. And uh, I, I think. Uh, the, in the United States, at least, with the World Reserve currency, they got a lot of tricks up their sleeves soon. Uh, there could be all sorts of coercive techniques. We still haven't gone to Fed coin yet. So we'll see how this plays out. You talking about 20% a year inflation in the Western world, that is something we could see. I'm, I'm not ruling that out. And that is that is bad. That's bad. It's really – it will be a huge loss of wealth for so many normies. And that is where Bitcoin is the insurance policy against something like that. I mean, you might be a Bitcoin hater now, people, but if you even think we could have something kind of like 20% uh, year over year inflation in, in the West uh, of the dollar, um, which did, I mean, that that was going on back in the Carter years, wasn't it? Uh, so for Jim, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, I don't uh, know about numbers uh, back then. But. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 it, it, it was, I mean, we had incredible... Uh, I mean, the mortgage rates were insane back then, from what I've seen. Uh, but, but, but the point, like, like my parents, what they paid on their mortgage. A a anyway, but interest it, rates were up too, so yeah, everything yeah. was different. You know, like and, I remember yeah, interest rates close to twenty percent on some investments in the eighties. Yeah, well, I mean, it was to counteract the past inflation. I mean, that anyway, we're not trying to stop inflation. In the United States, they're not trying to stop inflation anymore. Not they, now, they're not. If they try to raise interest rates, it'll implode the economy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, there were the the weird number, what we consider weird numbers from the 70s uh, or the early 80s uh, were because the, the, the Fed, not that I like a central bank, but the Fed was, Volcker was, was trying to fight it back then. But the, yeah. but the point is, is that, yes, Bitcoin, even a little bit of Bitcoin now, uh, if we get 20% inflation, uh, pe people will be very happy they, they, they had that insurance policy. So uh, I, I just want to go through real quick the rest of the stuff as we're getting at the end of the show. The, e the Van Eck spot market Bitcoin ETF, uh, the SEC rejected it this morning and the price of Bitcoin went down. Uh, I don't know why this shocks anyone anymore. They're going to keep on they're going to keep on rejecting these spot ETFs. Um, we, we, I mean, at least the, the, the other the other type of ETF they, they've approved of now. So, I mean, that that's cool, I guess. I mean, whatever. We're what one day they are going to approve the stuff. We, we should. <laughs> it's just amazing how the market. The when I see dips, I, I I mean half the time you see big dips now. It's just because of some nonsense news story that was so predictable. Like uh, the the other day when we had the all time high, we had a a a, a, a drop because the ever grand day uh, Chinese bankruptcy was official. I'm like, dudes. I mean, we knew this was going to happen. Just uh, I mean, if you do sell on on regular news stories, it's don't ha you don't get that simple thing that I say. Bitcoin always returns to its all time high. So uh, every little news story that takes it away from its all time high, it will be back. We're still in the bull market here, people. We are still in the bull market. So I just I wanted to point that out there. If anybody wanted my take on the uh, that ETF, because it was a, it was a headline this morning. Uh, who cares that the ETF? I mean, 
We're one day closer to a real ETF being approved. Uh, I want to, with uh, since we got a young, a real young dude on the show today, real, real, quick, and I want you to tell us about Australia, the scene there, uh, also. But another part of this question is uh, Coinbase says that the uh, their NFT business, they're about to set up an NFT, uh, uh, whatever, a place to buy NFTs and show off your NFTs, whatever, an NFT hub on Coinbase. It could be bigger than the rest of their cryptocurrency, what, what they do there. And to tell you the truth, um, there are people saying that NFTs are the Netscape moment for uh for cryptocurrencies, that this is going to get a lot of people into cryptocurrencies, which might be true. I I, I don't know. But Luke, what is your take on, on NFTs as a young person? Since it's most, it, it seems like it's so many, it's being fueled by young people. I mean, it's it's not people that are in their 30s. There's some, but I mean, it's really the TikTok crowd type of people that are that are into these things. So uh, what's going on in Australia and what's what's your take on NFTs? Yeah, NFTs, I personally think all of them today are going to lose 99% of their value in the next five years. And then even I go into these NFT spaces on Twitter and I debate some of these guys who are really big into NFTs and shit coins. And I say, hey, look, you know what? I don't care. You value your $5 million rock JPEG. That's cool. But wouldn't you want your rock JPEG actually on a chain that's going to be around in five or 10 years? Like if you love your art, you're not just going to hang it outside on, on a dumpster. You're going to want it in a house that's secure and actually safe and decentralized. If you're putting, if you're buying art that you plan to hold for the next five years, and if you're storing that on a chain like Ethereum or Solana that's not decentralized and very centralized, and I actually think it's going to get taken down very easily in the in the future, do you really value your art? Is it a is it a use case? I, I don't see that. I don't. So the whole NFT space it's questionable in my eyes. I like obviously people can do what they want, but I just think it's you know I, I don't think it's going to last. Um, and then Australia, um, yeah, Australia's in the news recently a lot. There's a whole lot of tyranny in Australia. Um, I think uh, I think it's more concentrated in the cities. Um, like Sydney and Melbourne have definitely got it worse. Uh, they can easily be cattle herded into the cities, and it's it's really disturbing the things they're talking about over here in Australia. But it looks like a similar battle that's been been fought in most countries around the world. I, I really hope you guys in America can, you know, make a stand for freedom. I, I was trying to get into the US recently, but I missed the deadline for being an unvaccinated person. Um, so I, hopefully that gets turned around. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, more and more people are standing up. Just um, they don't show it on the mainstream news. What a surprise. But there's there's tens of thousands of people rallying in every uh, capital city um, in Australia at the moment. So that's good to see. What's the uh, Bitcoin scene like in Brisbane? Anything going on? Yeah, the, I go to a Bitcoin meetup up there. and It's not too bad. It's certainly growing uh, with the bull market, obviously. Number goes up and it draws in new people. Um, but there's a lot of... There's a lot of kind of gambling culture in Australia. Everyone wants to bet on horses or cricket or any kind of sport, AFL, NFL, NRL, sorry. Um, so obviously a lot of them are into shit coins, um, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll get them there. We'll get them to the good side and get them out of the pre-mine securities that are going to zero. I, I, I like that insider information there, that they're into the they, – they're just – there's some gamblers. So no – have you noticed any growth in the, when, when everyone's been locked in their house in your country in more crypto talk in Australia at all, or is it relatively the same? Oh, definitely. The past 12 years is massive. And recently we had our largest bank, uh, Commonwealth Bank, who services like 25% of Australians come out and say, hey, look, next year you can actually buy Bitcoin and you can um, you can store it in your Commonwealth Bank bank account. So I think that's massive. I think we recently approved an ETF. Uh, it wasn't a spot one yet, uh, but there's talk of a spot ETF being approved shortly as well. So that's kind of weird. Like uh, Australia is going down the path of looking like a complete tyrannical police state. But then on the other hand, they're approving Bitcoin ETFs and they're also uh, the biggest banks in Australia are adopting Bitcoin. So it's it's interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting. But I'm going to tell you the truth, dude. I would rather be in a country where I can just walk freely and be happy, and they're not approving uh, Bitcoin ETFs or real Bitcoin ETFs, than be in you know a slave state where they approve, where you can like be in your basement and buy a, a Bitcoin ETF. I, I uh, here in the United States, you, you you wish us luck. We got states here. Don't worry. You, we we don't need luck. They're not they're not compromising here. There are plenty of people 
that will go down with the ship. It, it really hardcore. And, uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm proud to be in the United States. It's been the best country to be in during this entire situation. And it's the tip of the sphere and people are talking the talk. They're walking the walk. And, uh, I, I want the whole world to, to follow what many of the States, you know, Florida, Texas, everybody's doing, uh, here in the United States, but, uh, I'm glad to get your perspective and I really wish, I hope you can get out of there if things continue. What I really wish is that it, things don't continue badly there uh, in, in terms of tyranny and, and following the uh, Chinese fascist model that uh, has been embraced in uh, the Oceania part of the, the, the globe from New Zealand to uh, Australia, un unfortunately. Jim, any thoughts on uh, the, the ETF rejection, on uh, NFTs, on uh, any of this stuff we, we, we were just talking about? I always Maybe. got something to say, yeah. So ETF rejection. So you got a small group of people, other human beings that get to control everybody else. So on its face, I don't, I already don't like it. Uh, you know, the, the, they're, they're doing that not because they're protecting citizens. They're doing that because somehow it benefits them. That's, that's you know, because they have that power, they can manipulate how the outcome turns out and you know so maybe they were shorting bitcoin today knowing that the their answer was going to come out i mean these people that's what they do and so you know when you centralize power this is what happens people get screwed and people that want to be free and do things can't so i'm not a fa fan of any of that uh as far as the nfts go i agree with luke they're going to zero because once the collective mind of society figures out these things are basically worthless um there won't be any market for them anymore. And especially when they're built on these centralized blockchains that can be manipulated and altered and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of education that's going to have to take place for, for people out there. Uh, yeah, well, Jim, Jim, with the NFTs, you're familiar with Coinbase, obviously. It's yeah. such a, a mega corporation in the space yeah. and based in America. But do you think his prediction is true, though, that at, at least for a while, that the NFT, their NFT business could e eclipse the rest of their cryptocurrency business? Oh, sure, sure. The, the, you know, again, these are people, them, <laughs> you know, for, for whatever, whatever position they want to take on Bitcoin, they're still making fiat money. That's that's how they denominate their wealth in, in how much fiat money they earned. And so and so do all the people that use their system. Most, most of the people that are even into, even a lot of people into Bitcoin, but I would say all the people into cryptocurrencies generally are valuing their wealth in the fiat money they're used to. And, and only very few people value their wealth in Bitcoin directly. And so, um, sure, you know, there's enough people that will give up that fiat wealth for the next great thing that Coinbase says is going to be, is going to make them wealthy, uh, you know, because they don't take the time to educate themselves on what they're buying. They just don't know. And you, you have an exponential increase of noobs coming into the space now, right? For every person that tells two or four, you know, a couple more joints. So when there was only... A, 30 people on the mailing list from Satoshi, you know, how fast could it propagate? Now so many people know and it propagates faster and faster. And But those new people do not take the time. They're like, I got to hurry. What's the new one? Oh, buy that one. Oh, you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, people are going to get wrecked and this, other people are going to steal their wealth in dollars. And then the smartest people are going to turn those dollars into Bitcoin. Now, yeah, Coinbase is a publicly traded company. So, of course, they're going to value their wealth in dollars. And I, I agree with Jim on the point. I think Coinbase's NFT thing is going to be a huge moneymaker. So, all you Coinbase us for Coinbase. So, all you Coinbase stockholders are going to probably be, uh, be, be happy me, with, with, me, with results. Sorry, sorry. To me, it's not a moneymaker, it's a paper token maker, right? Because fiat money is garbage, right? So, they can make as much of it as they want. One day, it's all going poof. Well, I mean, bye they, bye. They, no again, they, they, they do their quarterly report and uh, the, the people who read their quarterly reports think of the dollar in a different way. And that's uh, that, that's yeah, their I fault. Get it. It, yeah, Everybody yeah. does. But once it hyperinflates, which it has to eventually, and even if it takes 50 years, it's going to happen. The dollar is going to become worthless. Everybody out there that uses dollars is going to know somebody that has Bitcoin or has had Bitcoin for some period of time exchanged some dollars for that Bitcoin back in the past and is doing way better financially. And they, and they kept hearing about it and they're like, why do I keep missing? What am I not seeing? And little by little, everyone's going to go, I got to get the Bitcoin too. I got to get some, you know, like the smartest people, there'll always be some outliers that'll never understand. Always. Of, of course. That's like the bell curve. There's always people at the extreme ends that are never going to get it at one, one end or the other, but the masses of people are going to see it one day. It's almost impossible to stop that. Again, it could take 50 years. I don't know, but it, 
there's a point where the, you know you're just gonna go wait a minute these guys over here are doing better we're over here you know i don't know i just feel like it has to happen i Maybe I'm wrong. I just feel like it almost has to happen. I do. I do love the 140 IQ people that have fun staying poor. They analyze it so much that they become paralyzed and then they never do anything with it. And some yeah. some dude, uh, you know, some hardworking man, um, you know, the truck driver dude, uh, he, he becomes a millionaire. It's it's great. I love it. That that's. I mean, that's that's the free market right well, there. I mean, Adam, you know, think about it. The people who own Bitcoin now the bulk of people who own Bitcoin now are not the wealthiest people in fiat terms around the world, right? But they will be the wealthiest people in Bitcoin terms one day. And so who is going to have all the wealth on this planet? Not the same people that have it now. And so the power and the, the shift in influence is going to go to better, more ideological, ideologically mind pe minded people that care about hard money, freedom, property rights, um, honesty, truth, integrity, all the things that hum that has allowed humanity to prosper, that that the wealth of this planet is going to move into the hands and is mostly in the hands of people who care about those things, not about selfish wealth for themselves. Uh, the ideology in Bitcoin is really powerful and really unique. And people in Bitcoin actually care about their neighbors. They really do. I feel it every time. And I actually feel it too, because if my neighbor succeeds, if this Bitcoin thing works and they win, I also win. It's yep. a win-win. It's a win -win. perfect. Yeah. Like they, it was it's built. Not a, it's, not a zero, it's not a zero sum game. It's exactly, not. A, exactly. Exactly. The exactly. incentives are aligned for everybody who gets into the system to win. Just play by the rules. We all get to win. Let's do it. Come on, everybody. Let's go. Make those pies, baby. Yeah, Pound that yeah. like button, everybody. I just got a flashback to Vention. Rest in peace, Vention, when we were just yeah. talking about truck drivers and, and regular guys that did so well with Bitcoin. I, I thought of him. I thought I thought of the, the great Vention. I just wanted to bring him up. Uh, you know, just uh, you know, always remember that. And, and it's just a reminder to everyone out there. You you could do real well with yourself. Enjoy life, dudes. And you're you're a young dude down there in Australia. Enjoy every minute of it. You never know, uh, you know, when it's gonna when it's gonna come to a sudden end or anything like that. So that that that's that's life is beautiful. Enjoy it, people. Uh, okay. And it's it's just sad when a government like Kiwi Bloke is saying that uh, he hasn't been able to get a haircut in freaking Auckland uh, the last three months. So uh, a place where you can get a haircut is uh, Miami. Uh, I get mine in Baltimore when I return because I've been going to the same place since I was like a 13 year old little boy. Um, but uh, Jim, we're gonna. Are you gonna be in Miami again for the event? Uh, oh this? yeah. Okay, Absolutely. April. So let's 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 talk about April 6th to 9th. Uh, the, the first day is basically the whale day. The last the last day is a concert day. The the seventh and the eighth are the hardcore you know speaker days. I am pumped to see 30,000 people there because you know at the, at, as I said at the beginning of this cycle, I mean. Were there even 30,000 uh, Bitcoiners on Twitter? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Who knows? Um, yeah, right. the, the crypto Twitter was just starting out, really, in, in 2017. I, I want to point out to people. I mean, in 2016, it was, wasn't was that big. 2015, it was like non-existent type of thing. But but going going back, so Jim, you're going to be there again. What did, yep. I mean, it was really great to, to, to see you in person there and everything. And you seem to really be enjoying yourself. I mean, you were, <laughs> you were running around. It was hot as anything out there. You yeah. were sweating. You were going from place to place. You might have had a few drinks. I don't know. No, I don't drink anymore. You don't drink. You were drink. part you were of my drinking. youth, but not anymore. I yeah. drink water every day. Like, it was yeah. a lot of well, – you were hydrating yourself. And I, I thought Absolutely. that was – you were hydrating yourself with something there, and you were, you were on fire. So tell us about your experience and if you're looking forward to this year. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward – to, I look forward to any time I can get in physical contact with other Bitcoiners and you got to go to where, you know, where everybody's getting together or, you know, visit friends. But, uh, you know, conferences work. You, you get to see a lot of friends all at the same time. And Bitcoin 2021 wasn't my first conference. So I got to see friends, uh, you know, so I, I was busier because I knew more people and it was just. You know, there's so much opportunity to have conversations that it just never stopped for days. I honestly. I, I was I was up four nights in a row till like three in the morning, back up again at like seven or eight every day for four days. Like when I was in my youth and I used to do it and drink every night. And I kept thinking, OK, I'm not drinking, so I can, I can handle this. I did lose my voice by about the third day, but there was just too much to do. So it was just so good. And like for anybody interested in Bitcoin, not only you get to go there, you get to learn, um, you get to build relationships, but you can also make business connections. There's so much 
potential in the Bitcoin space as the ecosystem grows. Businesses of all kinds are growing with it. And there's going to be f future demand for talent. You know, if you've got anything to bring to this space, you go to one of these conferences, you can, you can land the job of your life. You know, you never know. Uh, or, or just lead you to some entrepreneurial idea that you didn't think of because you're amongst people like, like forward thinking people. Uh, it's just like, it's so unique. I've been to like a half a dozen, maybe eight conferences over the last few years. And every one of them is totally worth the money I spent to go without a yeah. doubt in my yeah. opinion. Dude, you were so entrepreneurial when I met you originally in Las Vegas at Tone's uh, event. Yeah. With, the, Tone, Tone, with Tone. the cards. I still got them, Adam. I hand them out all the time still. I mean, it's just very I mean, Go that, do your homework. Here you go. Right. You know, you sorry. Say, that, that was Jim's like first. I mean, that really put you on a path of great notoriety in uh, Bitcoin because of being there that day. I mean, that I, I, that, well, that's the way I see it. I think that's that was the way. Wait a minute. Remember the weird turn of events that happened, right? So you of and course. I meet during the day. You start your podcast in the conference room after it ended in the corner. You have American Highland Trace Mayor. I decide I'm just going to walk up and watch. And you see me and go, Sir Jim, come say hi. So I get into the camera. That is the night Trace Mayor imploded his reputation and disappeared. And I have it literally be right there, like, you know, moments before it all happened when we walked up to the after party together. We were all together, right? That's when it all took place. And then you asked me on your show, you even promised me you were going to when we met in person. You're like, I remember your words. It will happen is how you said it. I was like, okay. And then a few weeks later, there I am on your show. So I have to give you a lot of credit for, for anybody who knows me. It's, it's partly because of guys like you gave me an opportunity to sit here and speak in public. And some people maybe it resonates with, and now I'm friends with other people all around the world. It's amazing. I'm blown away by the whole thing. It will happen. That is such a Meister quote. <laughs> that's, that's how I speak. My Lord. That's what you in said, person, bro. In, in person, I even speak like that. I mean, it's unbelievable. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jim is an awesome dude in person. He's just like this in person. I'm just like Thanks. this in yeah. person. So, yeah, we are, dude. We're regular folks. Yeah. You know, like, nothing special about me. I'm a hard, hardworking guy. I got Bitcoin. I'm excited for my future. I act the same way in person as I do on here. Same as Adam. Yep, that's what, is what you get. Uh, one thing you've really br brought up is the opportunity that's in this space for people who are proactive. And so we got a guy like Luke who isn't going to be able to come, yeah. uh, obviously, to the event. But a dude like Luke, you can get – all you got to do, Luke, is you know DM some of the dudes that own companies in the space that you like and just be pro – you'll get a job. I mean it's like – it's yeah, unbelievable. Dude. Guys you like you, they want young guys like you that are going to last – that are going to help build like an old guy like me. No, nah, not so much. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll find some niche if I even care. Point is you got a long life ahead of you. You got to keep making an income and build up your life. Maybe get a family, a house, whatever you got to earn. If you can earn in Bitcoin and help build this ecosystem, dude, the, uh, the sky's the limit. So yeah. Good yeah. Luck. I, so yeah, I, I want to, I want to do, I think someone should have a, uh, uh, a show, uh, one of those uh, reality shows where they pick a guy like Luke and say, hey, we're going to follow you around and see your journey to get an awesome freaking job in the space. You, you, That'd you be, will, be a winner. <laughs> it'll, it'll end in, in glory. So uh, it is such a golden age. And, and, and you know, Jim says hey, he's an old guy or something that he couldn't get a job in the space. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. You, you, you very much well could now with the, the reputation that you, you built for yourself. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, on the, on the marketing side, you could, you could become anybody's a spokesperson. They would pay. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. But, but Luke, okay. do you, you're, what, are, what, what, are, what are you up to uh, in terms of? Are you looking for a crypto job? What do you, what do you try? I mean, tell us about your podcast and everything. Yeah, uh, I was lucky enough to join the Bitcoin Made Simple podcast recently with Corey. Uh, if a Bitcoin only job popped up, I, I would jump at it. Um, there'd be nothing better than, like you said, earning Bitcoin and help help further uh, hyper Bitcoinization by working with a Bitcoin only company. If, if the opportunity arose, I'd jump at it. And I think anyone listening who's kind of on the on the fence um, about not sure whether they want to go to Miami 2022, I'd definitely go. Um, I think Surfer Jim said it earlier. There's nothing better than meeting. Bitcoin. Bitcoiners in person, you, you can talk for hours and hours and hours, and the the depth of conversation is something you just don't get in normie land. So I think Bitcoiners relish the opportunity they get when they finally get to meet a Bitcoiner face to face. If if the borders open up, and uh, I'll definitely be at Miami 22 if they let me in the borders, I would love to catch up with you guys face to face. Yeah, I I, I will say uh, the face to face. There's nothing like it. I got a guy in Europe who's like Adam. I want to come, but I'm not. I don't have the shot, so I could, America won't let me in. It's a freaking. Uh, it, it's a disgrace that it's, it, it it's come to that. But dude, yeah, Bitcoin only company. 
Coinbeast.com. How about Coinbeast.com? They, I've done things for them. Uh, you could be the Australian representative of Coinbeast.com. You're up at weird hours that no one else is. You could do their social media. And we uh, contact. I can put you in, in contact with someone over there to do a, a you know a, a part time gig. They might be interested in it. Just uh, uh, I got a guy. I, I mean, I'm already thinking of things on the air. That's you know that's how in motion I am. And right, so, hey, Adam. You know that's the thing. Other people in this space would look at Luke and say, how can I help this guy? Because everybody in Bitcoin just cares about like expanding the knowledge and helping everybody, helping the ecosystem grow for everyone's benefit. And here you are like actually trying to get the, this guy a job right on your own podcast, which is kind of <laughs> cool. Why not? Bitcoin I mean, is no, I know why not. No, I'm just saying this is just the ecosystem. It produces this kind of thinking. And this is the thing again, when we have these politicians who, who say they want people's lives to be better, but they want to restrict cryptocurrency. If they restrict Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, whatever, it's less jobs. These jobs that we're talking about, these are not jobs where you're digging a ditch, okay? Where it's what we've had to put up with for the last, you know, 100 years or whatever. This is that you don't even have to go into an office for these jobs. These are beautiful golden age people working at their lead whenever they want to work type of jobs. And I just can't see where people, men of the people like Bernie Sanders and, uh, that other man, Elizabeth Warren, if you know <laughs> how uh, whoever they, they, they can be taken seriously when it, but oh. people don't think they just they just react. They say Bitcoin bad. Thus, if my hero says it's bad, it's it's good. They don't they don't realize that it's it's hurting them in the long run. They're not going to be able to get these laid back Western jobs that uh, that that technology ha has given us. So I'm I'm always trying to get people these type of jobs and just show, living the golden light, golden age in the freaking Bitcoin overlay. I'm not just talking the talk. I'm walking the walk and I want other people to walk the walk. And it sickens me that these politicians are such virtue signalers that they, they don't want to think about, uh, they, that they want to restrict, you know, restrict and interfere with people's lives. Uh, the free market is truly about innovation. And whenever you get the government hand in it, it destroys innovation and thus it prevents you know, people living more comfortable lives. So, uh, Jim, any final words before we get out of here? Oh, wow. Uh, it's been quite a journey, but uh, it just keeps getting better. Um, for anybody looking at, at Bitcoin for the first time, or if you just get involved, or if you already believe, um, you know, just keep, uh, keep your head down, keep stacking as many stats as possible. One day it could take care of multiple generations of your family. If you stack enough, if you just, uh, you know, just, just, strong hand like adam always says this is a revolution uh the best form of money humanity has ever had to work with it's the fairest form of money it, it creates a level playing field for all people to trade with it's a it's a universal language so the whole world can communicate without having to fight over things it just changes a lot and future generations are really going to be the beneficiaries of this but it's up to us to keep it going you know we are the beginning of this revolution literally and 100 years from now they're going to look back and, and maybe not know us, but they're still going to thank us as a, as a community for, for holding strong and, and getting this thing going for everybody that comes after us. So, so just take this seriously, do your homework. The information's out there. It's free. Uh, and, uh, and don't ignore Bitcoin. You will regret it. Now, all three of the guests are linked to below on their Twitter feed. So uh, definitely follow them. Uh, Luke, we'll, we'll let you have the last word. Anything, anything else to say? Yeah, so for Jim nailed it. Uh, hold strong. Uh, speak the truth in these really revolutionary times. Um, as crazy and as dark as a lot of the things look like around the world, whether it be government tyrannical measures or whether it be potential hyperinflation, it's all an opportunity for the people who see it right. Um, all the chaos that we're about to see as we transition onto a Bitcoin standard, all that chaos, I think it's necessary to wake a lot of people up and move us onto a Bitcoin renaissance. So I think stay strong, be on the right side of history, uh, speak true for the next few years, because when we're on a Bitcoin standard, I think you will be rewarded and I can't wait to see it. Hey, you know what, Luke? Um, with the Twitter space that we were on was put on by CoinBeast. So you already know those dudes. Dude, yeah, they're sponsors of the show. Yeah, they're a great I'm company, saying, too. I'm, like, I'm, trying, to, I'm nice. trying to get you a job with somebody. You, you've already gotten yourself a job, basically. <laughs> Eventually, you're a subcontractor of them if they're sponsoring you. That's yeah, pretty exactly. good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, dude. Dude. so dudes, dudes, look at the opportunity. It's And it's a small little world out there, too. So we're Jim talking about networking in person. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a you can 
you could get through that network real quick, faster than Adam can even think because he, Luke already navigated it. Um, you know, the thing that I'm suggesting. So, uh, dude, like uh, this, this is a perfect example for anybody. At, at you know, you're in your mid, not even mid twenties yet. The people with the excuses that walk around all day, like, oh, woe is me. It's so hard. It's this, it's that. How, you've been in this space for like three years, three and a half, whatever it might be. You're, you're making connections. You're creating uh, content. You're helping. You're producing value. But you're also creating income for yourself in a space that's brand new and growing. And people make excuses like it can't be done. Are you kidding? Of course it can be done. Yeah. Great yeah. example, brother. Great example. No, I appreciate, I appreciate the kind words, mate. I, I really do. Um, far too kind words. I'm just no, just no, no. To be a big way too many people making up excuses and they're lazy and they're yeah. procrastinating yeah. and they eat junk food every day and they stare at the boob tube and they do what they're told <laughs> from the stupid television. It's ridiculous. You're thinking for yourself yeah. at a young age. Good for you, man. Success is going to be all over your life. Yeah, Don't appreciate let, it, brother. Don't let anyone tell you they're not opportunities out there in the world, people. If you are a West, if, if you've got connection to the internet now, you can get into this Bitcoin overlay and the sky is the limit. You could start your own podcast. You could you could work for any of these darn companies. You just got to be pro. And it's not like these, it's not the, the old days where you had to send in a formal resume. All their contact information is out there. You could tweet any, any guy that's in charge of one of these so-called big Bitcoin or crypto businesses or anything and, and be down with them. They will be impressed because so few people are proactive today. That, that's the thing. Even in this space, there are people that are, are you know down on themselves. They don't think they can do it. You can do it, people. Do not do not doubt yourself. So I, yeah, I want to I'll throw out one one completely random weird element here, and that is you can get a job in this space, and the company hiring you could hire you and not even know your real name and not care. Literally, like yeah. we care so much about privacy in this space that people will to hire you, not even know really who you are or where you live. You give them value, you produce value, they'll send you Bitcoin over the internet, and you don't have to know any more than that. That, that is, is a revolution in in hiring and, and producing value out for society that the average person can't even fathom. You know, that's that sounds like a Matt O'Dell tweet from like a couple of years ago or something like that. But it is so and I've never brought it. I Maybe I have brought it up on the show before, but I, I haven't thought about it for a while. That is how glorious this golden age is, is that, yes, you could be in a not totally uh, – anonymous person in some uh, the third world country and be working for some dude in New York city and he'll be down, which is paying you in Bitcoin or whatever. And that's, I mean, that is, I mean, that's the value of Bitcoin right there for the people yeah. that say it, there's no value at all. Look at this. You could be some anonymous dude anywhere and get paid. And what we're used to the old paradigm is send your social security numbers and this, that, that. Exactly. make sure you prove you're an American Dude, man, you could be working for some American kind, uh, American dude. You'd be living in the middle of Africa now, and they don't even know your freaking real name. And and it's legitimate business. It's 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 just so awesome. Very good point, sir, for Jim. Very good point. All right, dude. This this show was a long one, and even though we only had two guests for a lot of it, but man, it was a great one. So thank you, uh, Denver Bitcoin. You're maybe who knows where you are now. He's fixing up his house. That's what's going on. Um, but but Jim, thank you also, and uh, and 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 of course. Down in beautiful Australia, Luke, uh, may you be free soon in Brisbane. I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister. Shabbat Shalom. I We do this super spreading freaking Bitcoin 2022 show every week with this week in Bitcoin. One Bitcoin show. Keep on sending those donations. We need $69. That's when we'll do the next one. And uh, also on Monday when I'm traveling back to Baltimore, there's going to be the, the show I was on with BTC Benny last week will debut on this channel. So I'm Adam Meister to the Bitcoin Meister Disrupt Meister. Pound that like button. And again, have a great Shabbat Shabbat Shalom. Great weekend, whatever you guys are doing out there. And uh, yeah, I'll see you. And yeah, welcome to the fraternity for the people who made it through this freaking cycle. We are at 210,000 blocks uh, since that uh, all time high in December. My, what a freaking awesome ride it has been. See you guys later. Thank you. Strong hand. Thanks, Adam. All right. Thank you. All right. We're off the air. Let me just end it on.